also from PMU, and he'll talk about feedback driven business case for regulation. Cool. Thank you, Sachin. Um, thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm the last talk today, so I'll uh, try to not keep you away from fun stuff. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of our work. This is ongoing work over uh, several years, actually, on physics-based manipulation, um, trying to use uh, the mechanics of manipulation to manipulate objects, not just pick them up and put them somewhere else, but to actually push them, pull them, topple them, do all sorts of fun stuff with them. Um, so this is lighting. It is exhibiting non-prehensile physics-based manipulation as we speak, so we'll hold this on. Um, so uh, I want to give all the credit to uh, my students, some of whom are here. This is Michael, Jen, Laura, Anka. Um, I'm merely just a vehicle for their great research. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about Mehmet's work. Mehmet's now a postdoc at MIT. And Michael's work. Uh, Michael's a PhD student working with me. He has a paper at RSS um, tomorrow? Uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. So please uh, go to his talk. I'll, I'll try to give a very brief summary of his talk. So um, in, a, in a single word, the work that we do is manipulation. Uh, that's pretty much all that we do. We try to get robots to physically and forcefully interact with the world. Uh, this has been quite a, an endeavor for quite a while for us. And uh, we've done a lot of work on manipulation planning, getting robots to actually plan to pick up objects and move them around. And try to do that in a way that's uh, actually reasonable and real time. So here you see the HRP robot picking up an object, picking up a box and sticking it on the table, picking up the other box, putting it on the table, uh, dealing with constraints and uh, dealing with clutter, uh, but doing it in sort of a kinematic, uh, state feasible way. So this is extending uh, randomized sampling based planning algorithms to constraint manifolds and some of our recent work with Jonathan and Tim Barfoot on extending uh, randomized sampling based planning algorithms to optimal sampling based planning. Whoops. I'll just put this here. <laughs> all right, I failed. <laughs> um, but uh, all of these tasks, if you look at them, they actually are somewhat kinematic. The robot is moving from one place to another, picking up something, moving to some other place, and dropping it. So you can really solve most of these problems um, with sort of purely kinematic analysis, without having to consider dynamics, without actually having to consider physics. And that's kind of fun, and you can do a lot of things. But in the end, it gets a little boring um, and challenging. So the work that I'm going to talk about today is more on physics-based manipulation, how we can extend these planners not just to just pick up objects and drop them somewhere else, but to actually push objects around and deal with physics. And uh, when you start dealing with physics, you, have to actually, you can actually do a lot of extra things like non-prehensile manipulation, but it brings about its own several, several challenges. So I'll give you a brief sort of history of this work. This is sort of an honest summary of how we ended up when doing physics-based manipulation. Um, initially, it was just a total bunch of hacks. So um, we were, this is from the RMS project where we were trying to pick up a rock that's over, th over there. And our uh, robot couldn't see the rock. And so what we decided was, hey, if we do this sort of sweeping operation, we could actually center the rock right in front of the robot pretty much every single time. Regardless of the pose uncertainty that the rock had, we were able to create this sort of open loop funneling action that could bring the rock exactly in front of the robot so that the robot could pick it up. And, uh, and this was nice. And there's another example which actually I find even more fascinating. We were trying to pick up lug nuts. These are super tiny lug nuts with this incredibly imprecise wham arm with a battered hand. And this worked nearly every single time. Right? So we have this tiny little lug nut. We don't exactly know where it is. And the robot's sort of creating this little funnel. And it's using the mechanics of manipulation to sort of funnel all of the uncertainty into the hand and then pick it up. So we started thinking, OK, we're doing this several times. We're doing this very often. Clearly, it has some utility. Let's see if we can actually robot figure this out all by itself rather than us having to hard code it every single time. But uh, some of these uh, moves that the robot did actually looked incredibly interesting and unique and sort of very different from the way perhaps an industrial manipulator would manipulate objects. Right? Industrial manipulators traditionally um, pick and place objects. But when you start looking at physics-based manipulation, this could be sort of like how I might come up with a strategy to pick up a lug nut if I had a little like, claw grabber with me. I would like, push it around and pull it around and get it centered and grab it up. So we wanted to see if our robot could figure all this out. So to study sort of a variant of the problem, imagine that you have a perception system. And your perception system tells you that, hey, the object is over here. 
But like anybody who's written perception systems or used other people's perception systems knows, uh, 20 milliseconds later, it's going to tell you, actually, the object is over here. And like a little bit later, it's going to say, actually, over here, over here, over here. And so the question that the robot has is, how does it pick up this object in this like, fog of uncertainty? Right? How does it actually figure out a way to pick up this object in this like, enormous fog of uncertainty? Um, and this is a challenge that we almost always face, right? We use perception systems, they suck. Well, I, I write some of them too, mine suck too. Um, and, uh, and you wanna be able to figure out ways in which you can deal with uncertainty in a natural sort of physics-based way. And so humans do this all the time too. So the idea that we borrowed is actually from back in the day from Matt Mason's uh, master's thesis and also from work by Burge, which is to use the mechanics of manipulation to funnel uncertainty into your hand. So out here, what we're executing in sort of in the parlance of <coughs> optimal control is an open loop control policy. We're just taking the hand and sticking it forward and moving it forward. And what's happening is that it's really curling all the object hypotheses in, funneling all of that uncertainty right into the hand which is really cool because now what we need to do is just isolate the object uh, to some, some amount of uncertainty and just enact this push grasping action. This looks, this looks really great. So what we ended up doing is then decided, okay, this is a great idea. Let's see how we can actually turn this idea into an actual algorithm that we can use. And to do that, we actually borrowed a lot of um, a structure from both from um, Matt's uh, master's thesis, but also from some excellent papers in physics that talk about quasi-static pushing under Coulomb friction. The nice things about these models, these are obviously very approximate models of how the real world works. The real world is far more complicated than quasi-statics with Coulomb friction, but they're incredibly useful and they are order one to compute. They're analytical solutions that you can just roll out tens of thousands of. The, the, and one nice way to sort of test if you're, I'm borrowing somebody else's bottle, but a nice way to test if your system is going to be quasi-static or not is a quasi-static system is one that stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it. So you can experiment with objects in front of you and see how many of them satisfy that property or not. Uh, a lot of systems do, and a lot of objects actually don't satisfy that property. Like a ball on a table, if you stop pushing it, it's going to keep rolling, right? So those are the cases where, you know, our, our physics model will fail, right? There's no, there's no one uh, physics model that can sort of rule it all. And what we have is an approximation of physics that is able to solve several problems fairly analytically. It also allows us to sort of pick object mass, object surface friction, pressure distribution, finger object friction very conservatively, which means that these are numbers that are very, very hard to actually compute. But with these analytical models, you can actually approximate them very, very conservatively and get good bounds on them. So what we're able to do then is to actually find out these captured regions of various objects. So if you take that um, fuse bottle there, we use fuse bottles all the time in our research um, because I don't know why <laughs> they're available. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and this little shape that you see here, this like uh, hammerhead shape, is actually the capture region of that fuse bottle, which means that wherever you place the center of the fuse bottle, if it's within this region, then the robot will be able to capture it as it pushes it along, right? And this is derived analytically from the physics models that we have. Captured regions can be even more complicated. This is a three-dimensional capture region of a pop dart, again, something that we use very often in our lab. Uh, and you can see how as, it, as the theta changes, the capture region itself is also changing with it. So we can compute these full three-dimensional capture regions completely analytically. This is great because, like I said before, what this gives us is an open loop policy. So your perception system tells you, hey, I see this object here. It reports a pose. But you know, after a lot of experience with your perception system, that actually there's this uncertainty region where this object could be. This could either be a region or it could even be a belief distribution, doesn't matter. And what you're trying to do is, in effect, trying to find the smallest capture region that can encompass your uncertainty region, right? And this can be computed incredibly fast and analytically because we have this very simple quasi-static but analytical model. So in a way, what you're doing is that your object is in a fog of uncertainty. It's a bunch of objects. And you're trying to fashion the smallest possible net that you can toss on top of the object such that you can capture all of these objects. And this computation can happen really, really fast. So this worked out really well. 
what we ended up doing is, so this is an implementation of it, and a lot of the strategies that we had sort of hacked up together of like pushing an object as we were grasping it, actually ended up to be very emergent. So here's another case where we are pulling a book to the edge of a table and picking it up, and it's running the exact same physics model that we're running. It's actually a joint project with Doug at uh, Toyota. This is cool because we had all of these sort of hacks that we had uh, implemented that worked really well, and now we had at least endowed our robot to come up with its own hacks uh, at some approximate level, which is really, really nice. The other thing, of course, uh, sometimes you can do other things with the non-prehensile actions like stab robots. Um, this is from our Oreo video. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Non-prehensile manipulation, dynamic non-prehensile manipulation with deformation which we may be able to model. <laughs> <laughs> Extreme deformation. <laughs> irreversible, sorry, irreversible. So. Um, but the other thing that we can do, which is actually quite nice, is that we can chain a bunch of these actions, this is Mehmet's PhD thesis, to actually do reconfiguration planning. So here, the robot is pushing that box out of the way. This is doing a completely open loop. It's pushing one of the boxes out of the way and then moving in to pick up the other box. And again, coming up with this completely aut automatically because now we've endowed our robot with not just with a grasping pick and place action, but with a whole set of these manipulation primitives like pushing, pulling, and sweeping that it can enact uh, on clutter to reconfigure it to solve its primary task, which is kind of cool. So we, at this point, uh, were incredibly happy, and Mehmet declared success and graduated with his PhD. And then as we ran this system more and more, I mean, it worked really well for several times. Mehmet isn't here, so I can show videos of his work failing. Um, what we noticed was that every once in a while, um, the system would fail, right? This is running an open loop control policy, and uh, it, it just tries to grab the object and it fails. This could be because of a lot of reasons. I'll talk about a few of them. This is kind of incredibly amusing where it's very carefully thinking about, huh, how am I going to pull the book so that I can grab it? And then it pulls it and oops. <laughs> so um, that was catastrophic. Uh, and, and of course, the reason for this is that these policies are all completely open loop. The beauty of it is that it can work on any hand. It doesn't require any sensing. It doesn't require any perception. It really just requires a robot arm, and it, it's, it's really fast to compute, order one to compute. But uh, when you have any form of uncertainty, as this is sort of the theme of this uh, workshop today, if you have state uncertainty in terms of noisy post estimates or imperfect kinematics of the system, or even if you have action uncertainty in terms of the properties of the, of the world that are unknown. I talked about the coefficient of friction between the object and the hand, the coefficient of friction between the object and the table. These are all the like, coefficients of friction are these like magic runic properties that you never know. And you can, of course, find conservative bounds for them, but you can always be wrong. Even a little like sweat spot on your table, like there's a little spot here on this table, that drastically changes the coefficient of friction between the object, any object and the table. We've all seen this, right? When you're trying to clear a, uh, a dining table after you've eaten on it, when you pull on something, sometimes it sort of wobbles around and moves somewhere else. And that's because very minute changes, even in the moisture of the system, can actually drastically affect the coefficient of friction. So what we really need it's again sort of preaching to the choir, is some way of combining state estimation with some sort of sensing, let's say contact sensing, tactile sensing, and then using that state estimation to actually select actions reasonably well, right? And hopefully be able to do this fast enough that we can run it on a real robot without having to wait for several minutes because this is an online process that is being executed on the robot. The robot is gonna push grasp and it's not gonna wait for you to you know, compute your Palm BP. Uh, and so there really is this notion of let's do this as fast as possible while still maintaining some of the nice uh, analytical guarantees that we have with our physics model. So I'll first start talking about state estimation. And this is, again, sort of truth in advertising. When I started working on this, I, this was uh, Michael's work, the idea was that we would finish this in like a week. Two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. I gave Michael like two weeks to work on this. And, like two weeks, particle filter, boom. And um, it ended up being, I guess, um, about a year's worth of work. Yeah. And Michael's really smart. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was actually, um, and, and I'll actually talk to you about why it was really, really hard. So uh, let me talk about that problem. We're trying to do sort of real time state estimations, really, really s seemingly simple problem, right? We want to track the configuration of the object real time, and we got, let's say, we have some tactile sensors on the hand. There's been a lot of people who worked on this. Uh, Sherman today gave a talk about tactile localization, where you 
poke the object from several directions and localize it using adaptive submodularity and some of the variants thereof. There's also been work uh, by some people, including Rob, on tactile servoing, the idea being just like visual servoing allows you to servo to a visual image, tactile servoing allows you to servo to a tactile image. Imagine I want to have high contact forces in certain, certain of my tactons and lower in certain others. You can treat that as an image that you're trying to servo to. But the work that's actually closest to us that sort of encouraged me to think that we could do this in two weeks is actually work by uh, Jeff Frinkel's group on pose estimation. The idea being you have a nonlinear system, you run a particle filter, and you uh, track your pose estimates, you know, great success. And uh, so that was, that was sort of the idea, to use contact sensors for real-time state estimation. And just to be a little more sort of formal about it, we want to estimate the state of the object. And here the state of the object is sort of the pose in, let's assume for now it's pose in 2D, x, y, theta, se2. We have a certain set of control actions that we exert. Let's say, let's say we're pushing the object. We're giving the, uh, the hand a velocity twist in you know, little se2. And we're getting some observations, which are, let's say, some tactile data that either like a tactile sensor fires or gives you some number. Right? That's, the, that's the data that we're getting. But these are contact observations. It tells you when you have contact. It doesn't tell you anything when you don't have contact. So it's very, very discriminative sensors. So when we ran the conventional particle filter, CPF is going to stand for conventional particle filter from now on. It actually did pretty well in some cases, but there were certain other cases, the majority of the cases, where it performed like arbitrarily poorly. So the robot actually thinks the, the object is right in its hand, whereas it flew away somewhere else. And there are other times where we were getting this like random fluctuations of the pose estimates. And this was like really, really worrisome to us and, and very annoying because we thought, hey, this problem has been solved. So what's happening? Um, the other, this is the kicker, the other like incredibly bizarre fact uh, that convinced me that you know, Mike's code didn't have a bug uh, was this very interesting phenomenon where increasing the sensor resolution, making a better tactile sensor made the, co the conventional particle filter perform worse. So as your tactile sensor got better and better, mm -hmm. your particle filter started performing worse and worse, right? And um, I'm going to let you think about that for a minute. And, uh, and that was actually very interesting to us because it's, it's clearly something's wrong, right? Clearly something's wrong. And when we sort of scrutinized some of the papers that did tactile state estimation, they did this one really bizarre thing, which is as their sensor resolution got better, they actually artificially added noise to their sensor so that their conventional particle filter would converge. This is like you have this super expensive tactile sensor that you pay a lot of money for, but to get it to work, you need to add artificial noise to it, right? which, was, which is a little worrisome to us. So we thought, well, let's explore this and let's fix it. That led to several adventures. So very quickly, the conventional particle filter basically represents belief with a set of samples. This is something that you guys all know about. And it, has, and it does what's called sequential importance resampling. right? You are sampling a bunch of particles with some proposal distribution. Oftentimes, it's the motion model. You're proposing a distribution, and, and then you're updating it with your observation model. So you propose something with your motion model. It pushes all of the guys in front, and then you're updating it. You're weighting it with your observation model. And then you resample um, with replacement so that you don't have particle starvation and all of those fun things. Right? This is very conventional particle filter. So why does this not work? for the hand pushing objects. And the idea, once I explain it to you, is it's really obvious because the state is actually not evolving in SC2. It's not evolving in SC XY theta, but it's actually evolving on a contact manifold, right? which is a set of all positions and orientations where the object is actually in contact with the hand. Right? So pushing is a process where you have persistent contact with the object. You're, pers you're pushing the object as you're manipulating it. And the contact sensor is incredibly discriminative, which means that milliseconds, millimeters before you have contact, it's going to tell you nothing. Right after contact is when it's going to tell you something. Right? And so because the state is evolving on a contact manifold, the conventional particle filter is just sampling in SE2. Right? It's just sampling in the ambient space. So it is truly a measure zero set. Right? And as your sensor resolution gets better and better, it gets the, the contact manifold gets less and less fuzzy. It becomes more and more defined in your state, evolves more and more on the contact manifold. And so you need to toss more and more particles so that you get close enough to it. Right? 
It's like you're trying to sample a measure zero, so you're trying to approximate a measure zero set, and the only way you can do it is by fuzzing up that measure zero set into something that has finite measure, which is the way you do it is by adding noise to the system. So this is completely wrong, right? It's not way, the way we should do it. So, uh, and, and this is sort of a coloring of what actually happens. There are various patches on the contact manifold that are created by the various sensors that you touch. So there's some rich structure on this contact manifold that if you can just actually identify and exploit, we can actually get rid of particle starvation, which is the process where your conventional particle filter starts to worse because it's actually not sampling direct distribution. So the, the sort of immediate thing we talked about was, well, why don't we sample from the contact manifold? Why can't we just sample from the contact manifold to avoid particle starvation? So when we started thinking about this, we thought, well, surely there must have been a case in the past where we went from a really crappy sensor to a really good sensor, and suddenly all of their algorithms stopped working. Do you guys, can, you, can you guys think of it? Maybe exactly, good. Costas gets like gold star. <laughs> okay. So this actually, has, maybe it's because Costas and I are so old that we've actually worked with sonars. And, yeah. So if you guys have worked with sonars, sonars suck. They're really, really bad. And so what happened was that when people went from la sonars to lasers, they had this like bizarre, uh, effect, which is that all of their localization algorithms stopped working because of particle starvation. It was just too good, right? And so they started adding all sorts of hacks by like adding noise until these guys, Sebastian, Dieter, and Wolfram, actually came up with what's called the dual proposal distribution. The dual proposal distribution basically says that there's two things that you can, that, that, that affect the performance of a particle filter. The motion model, which, which you, in a conventional particle filter, you use to roll out, and the observation model, which in a conventional particle filter you use to reweight. What they observed was that, well, actually, our observation model is the one that is most discriminative of my post-contact post belief, of my posterior belief, right? And so they said, well, why don't we just sample, why don't we do the rollout from the, with the observation model and then reweight using the motion model? Just flip the order in which you're using the motion model and the observation model. And that was, that was their insight. But there's a slight difference between a laser and an accurate tactile sensor. A laser is accurate all the time, right? A laser gives you a distance to your nearest obstacle all the time. Whereas a tactile sensor is kind of funny in that it tells you absolutely nothing 90% of the time until you make contact and it gives you perfect information, right? A tactile sensor is like the reduction of a laser to like zero distance, right? It's like a bump sensor. So if you just use the dual proposal distribution, you would do amazingly well when you have contact, but you would do completely crappily if you didn't have contact, right? So you can't use the conventional particle filter because it performs really badly when there's contact. You can't use a dual proposal distribution because it performs really badly when you don't have contact. So the obvious thing to do is to actually come up with a, an actual manifold particle filter, right? Which is a combination of the primal and the dual particle filters that actually understands the fact that state doesn't just evolve in the ambient space, doesn't just evolve on the contact manifold, but evolves in the joint C space of the uh, ambient space as well as the contact manifold. And this generalizes to like N manifolds, right? And really what you should be doing is chasing probabilities in this joint space, right? So that's exactly what our algorithm does. It's a dual proposal distribution for the for the contact manifold and uses the primal proposal distribution for free space, and it does some rather interesting things to compute these weighting probabilities. And what it is able to do at the end is when you don't have contact, and this is sort of property that just emerges out of just running Bayes rule correctly and doing the correct normalizations. When you don't have contact, it's running the primal uh, particle filter. When you actually make contact, then it actually switches, migrates all of the particles to the dual particle filter, and it's just doing that automatically. So it's just migrating particles back and forth from the primal to the dual. And this sort of generalizes to you know, n manifolds. So here's sort of the algorithm in action. Initially, you have just free space. That's where the object is. That's, a, um, that's the probability density function that I'm uh, rendering uh, of the object. So you can see that it's sort of fairly noisy. and um, the primal particle filter is actually doing pretty well. The dual particle filter is actually doing really poorly because when you don't have contact, you, wanna, you, you have no idea where the object might be. But you can see that the weights for the primal are far greater than the weights for the dual because the system actually is running you know, Bayes' rule and knows that there is no contact. 
So even though this is performing poorly, it's being downweighted. As you keep moving, and this is sort of instance before contact, you can see that the primal is still doing uh, reasonably well, but it's getting worse. And the dual is actually doing pretty poorly. As soon as the instant you make contact, you can see the degeneracy in the primal particle filter because it actually thinks there's no manifold. And so it's getting squished. And the dual particle filter is like, yay, I, know I made contact, so I can do really, really well. And the probability distributions of being on the manifold or not on, on the manifold have switched. So now the system gives more weight to the dual and less weight to the primal. So this sort of balance sort of naturally emerges. And yes? So this will be the most time that depends. Uh, is it your model of whether you on or off? Exactly. Correct. Exactly. Yep. Um, we'll talk a little bit. There's a chicken and egg problem of computing those probabilities and computing your posterior. Um, and there's like several things that we do to do that, but I can, I can talk more about that offline. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and then as you keep running it, it just gets, gets, gets better. So this is, this is actually kind of fun. And if you look at the uh, final distribution, you can see that it's actually quite extremely peaked around where the contact actually ought to occur, right? With far fewer particles. So the final belief state for the conventional particle filter, you can see this degeneracy with the conventional particle filter. It's a little unfair. It's like it doesn't know there's a manifold. And with the manifold particle filter, because it actually is running Bayesian inference on the correct state space, it's, it's actually doing really well. So this is the um, manifold particle filter in action. It's sort of pushing the object and actually doing pretty well. This is using the uh, same number of particles as I showed you before, and it's not exhibiting much of the degeneracy that uh, plagued the uh, conventional particle filter. It's actually particularly interesting because these are the, uh, this is the iRobot hand, and the hand itself uh, deforms as it's pushing the object, and we're not modeling that, and it's still actually doing somewhat decently. So well, how is the performance? Before contact, the uh, a conventional particle filter and the manifold particle filter perform identically because you haven't had any contact. It state is actually truly evolving on in SE2. Right after contact, the manifold particle filter, that's the orange line, outperforms the conventional particle filter as expected because it knows there's a manifold. The other guy doesn't know there's a manifold. And that's, that's really good. The other thing is, this is the previous graph that I showed you of the conventional particle filter having this bizarre property of performing worse with sensor resolution. The dual particle filter actually does the right thing. It does better as your sensor gets better, which is really good. So very quickly, I wanna, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk a little much about this, but there is this sort of um, important fact that we need to be able to draw samples from the contact manifold. Right? I just said, hey, it's a manifold. We can draw samples from it. But like charting a manifold and drawing samples from it is not very easy, as we discovered. <laughs> Um, so this is my favorite way of doing it, is to actually do sort of exact Minkowski differences. Um, if you have polyhedral, polygonal objects and polygonal worlds, then you can actually compute the, the C space of the object exactly. This is like my version for my thesis. This is uh, Mike's version. Uh, you can do this using like Seagal, for example. But this is not very scalable. I mean, if you don't have polyhedral objects, if, you don't, if, you, if your system isn't uh, perfect, then obviously it's not going to happen. Uh, there are two other methods that we tried out. One was something that I wouldn't recommend, which is uh, rejection sampling, where a priori, right, what you do is you drop a whole bunch of samples, and then you compute the nearest distance to the manifold, and you create this sort of fake representation of the manifold using just particles. And then you use that to sample with your kernel density estimation. Um, the other thing that we did, which was actually fascinatingly good, is using what we call trajectory rollouts. Um, Renal said I'm using learning. I'm very embarrassed to say that, but it may be true. Um, but the idea being that, well, if I want to figure out where the manifold is, maybe learn, um, all I need to do is roll out my simulator a whole bunch of times and track where the object ends up in my hand. And these are all the rollouts that you're getting. This is kind of much better than rejection sampling because it actually tells you the parts of the manifold that are useful for grasping that object. Right? It's not wasting computation. It's actually focusing computation on the places that you want to actually focus computation on. And these rollouts actually outperform the analytical model. This is like shocking to us. But the reason why I think, we think, the rollouts outperform the analytical model is that not only are they representing the manifold well, they're also overfitting to your physics simulator. So 
uh, Mike's physics simulator has some like intricacies to it. It has some noise. And the rollouts are actually modeling that in a proxy when they're modeling the manifold. So if the waviness of the manifold is sort of a reflection of sort of the waviness of the physics simulator. Whereas the Minkowski differences are like, I don't care about a physics simulator. I'm going to model this exactly. They actually perform much worse. So it's just kind of an interesting uh, insight from it. But the nice thing about these uh, rollouts is that you can just simulate it, and you can grasp the object however you wish without having to actually compute exact Minkowski differences. But if you, if you could, you know, I, would, I would suggest that. So um, really, I think the highest level bit takeaway from here is that contact does occur on a lower dimensional manifold. And it's something that when you actually acknowledge and you appreciate and don't sort of hack around, you can rewrite the just straight out conventional particle filter, and that's just Bayes' rule with chasing the normalizations correctly in the dual, um, both in the primal as well as in the dual space. It's a little challenging because you have to deal with measures and make sure that your probabilities add up to one, even though you have space probability spaces of two different measures, one in SE2 and one on the chart on the manifold. But once you do that carefully, you can actually get a system that exploits the contact manifold and improves the estimator's performance. So that's, I think, where I'm going to stop. Um, this is just a, a, a sketch of what I said I would do. Uh, we talked a lot about the state estimation. Um, Michael is going to talk about the action selection on Tuesday. Um, in a, the one sentence version of the action selection algorithm is that we exploit two things. One is the fact that state evolves on the contact manifold, which means that you have a lower dimensional representation of the state, which we call the post-contact belief, which you can actually uh, compute offline. The other thing is, this is kind of interesting about the contact manipulation, but perhaps about other POMDP problems, is when you're trying to grab an object, it really breaks down into two stages. First is blindly try to find the object, and once you find the object and you've made contact, manipulate it so that you can grasp it. The interesting thing about the blindly try to find the object is that it's just a straight out open loop policy. Right? You're just running an open loop policy until you make contact, and then you're grasping the object. So we came up with a, a, an interesting way of decomposing the problem into pre and post contact POMDPs that we were able to solve pretty efficiently. So we can get it in near real time performance. Thank you. Of course, yes. Uh, in the set of states uh, that is your object is there, you're essentially able to grasp it, right? You don't have to go there. Uh, in the simplified problem, do you let this, uh, the states uh, into uh, you know, graspable states and then that gives us the contact to the first one? Or the so um, w that's an interesting question. So basically, Costas' uh, point is that there are certain places where I can grab the objects or another places where I can't grab the object. I think that. One, that work, right? The push grasping quality evaluation talks about how you can you can sort of evaluate the grasp quality. That's interesting, but I think what it perhaps maybe I'm misunderstanding, but what it perhaps fails to capture is the notion that the object moves into the hand as you're grasping it. So it's not just about whether that object is graspable at that particular state. It's about if you run the dynamical system that is the state evolution as you're pushing it, will it eventually end up in a place that, you, that is graspable, right? So it's like a, it's a C-space funnel, right? You have a set of states, and then with, when you run your dynamical system with your physics simulation, it ends up in a much lower dimensional state, some of which is graspable. Yeah, so I, I, and I think so that's what the capture regions sort of give you, right? It, gives, it, it decomposes your, your space into, I don't care about physics, I'm going to grab this object. Uh, I care about physics, and I'm going to grab this object, which is sort of at the side of the hammerhead that I showed you. And like this stuff with this current physics is not graspable. Right? So that's, that's, it's cool. Um, it's analytical, so you can just, just sort of roll it out and get it very, very fast as you change the aperture and various parameters. Thanks. We cannot really treat perception and planning separately, right? I mean, we realize the importance of having to consider them uh, jointly because planning under uncertainty is a, is a big problem. It's becoming increasingly relevant as you have different kinds of sensors that are being used uh, to perceive the objects in the world. You have more unstructured environments. The robots might not have seen objects that they're dealing with. And uh, so 
this is this is an important topic, right? How do you identify objects? How do you localize objects? How do you grasp objects? How do you manipulate them, and so on? And speakers today, a lot of talks, you know, they, they range from efficient methods for for solving this planning under uncertainty problems. Sorry. So they talked about efficient methods for, for solving the planning under uncertainty problems, how you can cut down time from maybe hours to, to seconds. And maybe you want to get down to sub-second times for, for this to be you know, used in um, practical applications. And then there was this challenge of continuous state, action, observation spaces. And then in grasping and manipulation, there is this, adi there's this additional complication of contact. And we've seen that contact complicates a lot of things. Um, and we also saw you know, people talk about different ways of dealing with this uncertainty. So there was this aspect of using maybe the cloud for dealing with uncertainty and scaling it up to you know, different objects, or maybe using crowdsourcing and selecting what demonstrations are good and what are bad. And applying to this to grasping and manipulation, I think, is a, you know, is, is a very interesting area. And unfortunately, we don't have time to have an open forum for discussions of you know, what, what interesting open problems exist out there. Um, but some of, some of them come to mind. For example, you know, if, if a robot you know, sees an object, how much information does it need about the object? Right? Does it need a complete model of what its shape is, what its mass is? Uh, can the robot infer this from exploratory actions, uh, like we saw some of the speakers talk about today? Or can you just have a model-free way of learning a policy of how to grasp and manipulate a, a particular object? And that's, that's an interesting question. And then. You know, as, as we have newer types of sensors, you know, how can you incorporate that? So for example, you have tactile sensors, you have depth sensors. We have uh, depth sensors coming out on cell phones, which might come out as early as next year. You know, can you use that for more reliable uh, grasping and manipulation? Uh, maybe you can have those mounted on robot hands and do an eye in hand depth sensor kind of operation to do more reliable grasping. And then multi multimodal sensor inputs, right? So you have you have inputs coming in from maybe a depth sensor, maybe tactile sensors, and other, other sorts of sensors. How do you fuse them into a representation of an object that you could use for, for grasp and manipulation planning? I think that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, thing to look at. And what if these sensors are mobile? Right? So typically, setups have this depth sensor mounted at the, the head of the robot and it's looking at an object. But what if these sensors are mounted on hands? What if these sensors can be moved around to gain more information about the object? So for grasping, if you look at an object, you only see one view, but you typically care about antipodal surfaces. So can you move another sensor into the, into the view or have a tactile sensor feel the object and grasp it reliably? And then uh, dealing with contact, as we saw, is a, is a big problem. And so what, what can you do about, about contact? Or maybe you want to employ some, some strategies or heuristics that you can funnel you know, uncertainty and, and, and deal with this. And also, um, you know, longer, longer term vision. So for example, we've seen strategies for dealing with maybe a single object. You know, how, do you, how do you deal with that? But what if in, in a more general scenario, you had multiple objects, so you had clutter. So you don't really know what, where the object is, you know, that, that you have to grasp, and so you have to identify it. And for, for more complicated manipulation tasks, you might not just have a few time steps that you could just plan, but you might want to consider some sort of a hierarchical planning kind of a scenario where you, for example, if you have to tie a knot and do something with it or move across the room and accomplish a particular task, a manipulation task, you have to thread them through. So it might not be just a single low-level planner. It might be a high-level planner that gives you certain objectives, and then you tie them up. And how do you funnel the uncertainty through all these, uh, through these, all these different stages is, is important. So, I mean, there are lots and lots of interesting open questions here, right? I mean, what we, what we would like to have is maybe you just put an object in front of a robot or several objects in front of a robot, and the robot does exploratory actions, figures out what the objects are, figures out how to grasp them, manipulate them, and just, just finish the task. Right? But that's, that's long ways ahead. So this, hopefully, this is, this is the first step towards, towards that, and we'll see more interest in this, in this area in the coming conferences and, and workshops. And so I would like to thank all the, the speaker participants for coming out and staying this late. And this was, uh, yeah, this was a really good workshop, I think. So a round of applause to all the participants and speakers.
So all the abstracts uh, and the slides are on the workshop website. And we've also recorded videos of all the talks. So I'll send out an email to all speakers to get their waiver consents. But after that, we should, we'll host them on YouTube and also send out an announcement to robotics worldwide. So hopefully, this will reach out to a much bigger audience. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>